Good evening. Good evening. Thanks, Ken. Yep. I can always count on you for that. I got a little bit of feedback. Is that good? It's a little hot. That's why I just set her up for that. That was part of the script for tonight. Good? Well, welcome to uh, spiritual dis- discipline class number whatever. I don't remember how many we're in. How many? Five. Five. Okay. And then we have one more after this, which is Pastor Aaron. I almost ran from here and said, Aaron, you got it. But he's not listening. So anyway, let's try to pick on you, Aaron. Um, anyway, I'm, I'm Pastor Derek. Uh, so, some of you I don't know, and uh, so I'll just introduce myself a little bit. Um, I've been, I've been here at Cormdale for 13 years. I had to figure that out. I'm bad at math, but Lisa and I finally figured it out. 13 years. But I didn't answer this question. How long have I been a pastor here? 10? Ish. 10. We'll go with 10. It's a round number. Um, and uh, I've been married to Lisa for 29 years. 30 in April. I see I did that part right. And I have two adult kids, Tyler and Emily, and they're both in the room as well. So it's really cool to see if I don't know you. Come up and see me afterwards. I'd love to say hi and shake your hand, and I'll forget your name, and we'll reintroduce ourselves next week. So um, (laughs) anyway, let me pray. We'll settle down the nerves a little bit. I haven't done this in a while. I was just telling um, telling him that. So we'll, uh, and then we'll get get going. God, thank you so much for uh, this time to, to get us out here to... Um, go through spiritual disciplines to talk about them, see how they apply to our lives. And tonight, I pray that if nothing else, Lord, we will know that your word is so important and we need your word um, for for our lives. And I pray that we walk away with this, with nothing else, if if nothing else, to know that we can read your Bible. God, I love you. I thank you so much for this. I ask you um, just uh, that this time would be super fruitful for all of us, God. Amen. <clears throat> so, we've been through quite a series on um, introducing this idea of spiritual disciplines, and I trust that you have benefited so far. As, and as a reminder, this is, I kind of stole this from Brandon a little bit in his class. This is a paraphrase. I paraphrase everybody. Um, that spiritual disciplines are methods we use to train ourselves in our spiritual growth with the goals of knowing God better and glorifying Him. And this is my paraphrase. This is, I'm paraphrasing myself here. They are like seatbelts that keep us in the gospel car. So tonight, we're going to explore the spiritual discipline of Bible reading or Bible study. Um, and, and reading and studying the Bible as the connecting agent of, of God's ideas written in Scripture. And now there are, are a myriad of ways that we could go about this. And there's, there's so much information on your, on your Bible, how to read it, what is it, all that stuff. Um, and it could be like drinking from a fire hose. And for some of you tonight, might be drinking from a fire hose. Um, but I, I want to try and simplify, simplify this down quite a bit. Um, first of all, this is an intro to reading. So we're just going to skim um, at, the, at, at the very top level. Um, but I have two folks in mind as I was thinking about getting this class ready. I have two categories of people in mind. And, and the first one would be new believers, and the second one would be the blue-collar worker. And now you might think that's funny or odd that I would categorize that way, but as I was getting this class already, I was really thinking of conversations I've had with people over the years about reading their Bibles, and these folks tend to be the, quote, non-readers. The new believer, because of not knowing where to start, um, and the blue-collar guy, well, just flat out doesn't want to read. Thanks, Kim. Appreciate it. And <laughs> I tell jokes a lot that people don't laugh at. And Kim's laughing at all of them. This is awesome. Um, even though the blue-collar guy does read his phone every day. And I don't think it's because of laziness necessarily, but about getting started and sustaining that work that takes a lot of work to keep that going. And I think that might need help or encouragement to encourage reading our Bibles. You older Christians, there's many of you in here I could tell, Um, You might benefit as well. Um, As I know with any discipline, over time it could stagnate or get away from us. And perhaps this time for uh, uh, tonight will be time for you to be encouraged and invigorated to start reading again out of joy. And that's my goal is that you can see that you can read your Bible. You get to read your Bible. 
So I'm going to approach the subject matter in, in these ways as a way to introduce us to the spiritual disciplines. Four categories. Um, hopefully these are up here. Yeah. What is Bible reading and why is it important? What does Bible reading do and why does it matter? How does the gospel propel us, propel us to read our Bibles? And lastly, practical discipleship steps in reading our Bibles. Tonight, our primary text, if you have your Bibles, this, this would be a good exercise for you. Um, you can open up to 2 Timothy 3, 10 through 17. Um, and just so you know, I'm going to kind of work backwards through the text. I'll read it forward because that's the only way we understand it, right? But I'll work backwards um, uh, and to see if we can build our case here on, on why is this subject matter is so important. Um, so let me first read our text, and then we'll start diving in. You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and Lystra, which persecutions I endured, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will, will be persecuted, while evil people and impostors have gone from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue to what you've learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred, sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So what is Bible reading and why it's important? That'll be our first category we're going to kind of go through. And I had, I had to come up with a definition to kind of anchor us down a little bit. And I have two definitions. One's the long one and one's the short version. So I'll give them both to you. See which one you like better. Um, the long one. Bible reading as a spiritual discipline is a training method that informs the reader regularly of the nature of God's activity as he interacts with humanity. It informs the reader of his character, his desires, his love, his holiness, and his gospel as displayed throughout all of Scripture. A disciplined approach gives the reader a faithful and lifelong anchored adherence unto God's desires for the reader and faithful obedience and living unto God through Christ. Bible reading gives us intimate and relational worth with God. It is the vehicle for endurance required for faithful Christian living. So that's a long one. The short one is this. Regular Bible reading develops, matures, and strengthens Christians. I like that one. It's shorter. So let me ask this question, and this is interactive. I like to be a little interactive, so I'm going to make you nervous by looking at you. But I'm going to ask this question and see what kind of answers we get. I want to ask this question first. What is the importance of reading the Bible? I mean, we do lots of things as Christians. We worship, we sing, we take communion, we pray. What weight does the Bible have? What info does it give us ultimately? So let me ask the question again. What import, what's the importance of reading the Bible? Anybody? And it's okay. Shout out an answer. Knowing God. Great. Good answer. How God wants you to live. Fantastic. Story of our redemption. Yep. Anything else? Yes. Yes. Obedience. Another one. Anything else? Owner's manual for life. None of these answers I thought of, by the way. This, this is pretty good. I think I don't have to teach a class. You guys are doing great. Um, anyway, all those answers I think I can encapsulate in this way. Because ultimately we want to know God, right? We want to know him. We want him and what he desires, right? We want him. We want to know him better, correct? Somebody said that. I think it's this. Reading gets us close to God. I think this text specifically has a clue for us to look at. I want you all to look at verse 16. Look at verse 16 if, you're, if your Bible is open. All Scripture is breathed out by God. Reading takes us into God's breath, which gives us an idea of closeness and intimacy, bringing us face to face with God. It takes a reader closer to God's words. For example, myself as a hearing impaired person, did you see what I had to do to hear you? I had to like step forward 
look at you, make eye contact, right? Because I, if I don't know your voice, I have to read your lips and try and succeed in listening and hearing you guys. It's the same thing. We can liken that idea to God's words of Scripture being breathed out onto us. As he breathes his words out, we can feel the heat of his breath. The words coming from his mouth being the same source that created the universe, for crying out loud, was, was words. It makes us pay attention. It makes us take action, taking steps to get closer. You get that idea? Listening more intently. And it's much like in marriage, getting close to your wife or husband intimately, knowing them in closeness and nearness. It brings us together. So the importance of Bible reading is that it gets us close to God. It encapsulates everything you guys said. So next, what does Bible reading do and why does it matter? So we're going to ask another question. Interactive, okay? You guys did a great job. We'll, we'll, we'll exercise this a little bit. Let me ask this question. What does Bible reading do? Kind of a little bit more difficult thing. What does it do? Yep, increase our wisdom. Makes us more like Christ, yes. Holds us accountable, yes. Anything else? Absolutely, absolutely. Practical examples. Yes, reminds us of what true, what is true. Fantastic. Let me, ask, uh, let me ask it in this way. It's a different, different way of asking a question. What role does a seatbelt play in your car? Keeps you safe. It keeps you strapped in, right? Keeps you strapped in as you travel 60 mile, miles an hour down the highway. By the way, isn't it, when you realize that, isn't that the most thing, dangerous thing you do? It, it, as a UPS driver, I know. It's the most dangerous thing you guys do every day. You don't realize it, right? Regular scripture reading is the holy seatbelt for our lives. It keeps the reader strapped in the gospel vehicle and helps you focus on the task ahead of you in life. Just like you have to reach across your shoulder to pull the uh, seatbelt down and, and click it, right? You make a conscious decision to, pull, to, to open the Bible and read because it does something, even if you don't see the immediate effects. Do you, when do you notice the immediate effects of a seatbelt? When you crash, and it's sudden, right? I just got that all on video. That was awesome. Um, <laughs> similarly, could it be that the, the Bible has similar effects, right, as we get closer to God? Well, let's look at verse 16 again, and let's dive in a little bit deeper and see if we can develop this. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. So we see here that all Scripture is profitable. God's Word has value as it gives us something. It does something. It profits us by gaining security in Him. It doesn't take away anything except perhaps our devotion or our lives, but it profits the reader, which indicates that the reading and knowing Scripture gives us ultimate gain for our lives, which is what? God himself, knowing God. And it does this in several ways. It's articulated this way in this, in this text. All Scripture is profitable for teaching. So teaching implies that there's learning to be done, right? Um, the, of the learning to be done most specifically of the things of God. And perhaps the most important things of life are to be learned through the things of God. All Scripture is profitable for, what's the next one? Reproof, which speaks to us that it stops us in our tracks and our, uh, or our wrongdoings, rebuking us of our sinful lifestyles. It tells us that our position or our disposition is against God and that we are opposed to him. It gives us information of the gap between the holiness of God and our sinful lives. It stops us in our tracks. What's the next one? This builds on each other. You'll see this building. What's it? Correction. correction. All Scripture is profitable for correction. Not only does Scripture expose us and stops us, 
It makes straight the crooked. It gives us the information of how that happens. It rights the wrongs. It restores us unto God. It closes the gap and gives us the right direction to go. And lastly, we can see that all Scripture is profitable for training in righteousness. It gives us positive instruction on how to live. Not just the negative law of don'ts, don't do this, don't do that, stop it, all the things you said to your two-year-old, or maybe a 40-year-old, I'm not sure, uh, but a positive direction as well. It's a whole repentance thing. So we stop doing this, and we turn around and go the other direction, right? It does both. So if these things, these things do this next thing. So in verse 17, look at verse 17. These things build upon this, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So that we can see that teaching, reproof, correction, training, righteousness does this. It does what? It completes man. And the, and the definition that John MacArthur gave of this idea of being complete means that, it w- that we would be capable of doing everything that God has called the individual to do. So we would be complete. And then what? Equipped. That we'd be in- complete and equipped for every good work. Meaning, so that what that means is that it would meet the demands of righteous living in a world that is opposed to God. The scripture reading does something else also, and it reminds us of our beginnings of our faith, our salvation. So if you back up to verse 15, that, and please look at, your, look at your text. I'd love to see if you see the pattern that's happening that Paul is doing. Verse 15 says this, and from how childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation. So we see that it, it's profitable in those categories and that the profit makes us, the profit, the profitable end of it makes us complete and equipped and also makes us wise to, to salvation, which reinforces and informs us of the gospel. We are prone to wander in self-destruction. We already know that. We feel that. Even if we don't verbalize that, we know what our hearts are wanting. And it, a disciplined reading of Scripture reminds us that all of Scripture is profitable, and the end goal is to make us wise to the gospel. It's a cul-de-sac. It's round and round and round, reminding us of how much we need the gospel jammed into our hearts. Keep reading and keep reading, keep reinforcing the idea that we need the gospel, sometimes now even more than ever. So, number two, why does a discipline of reading your Bible matter? So let me ask you this. Having given all that information, why might, reading, why might having a discipline of reading your Bible matter? If you, if you have all that information, let me just ask a question interactively. Yeah. <laughs> yes, okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, keeps you sharp, right? Yeah, for sure. So I, I know that our, our text has given us so many, um, um, many clues and, and very good answers, but I want to take a moment and dig into the section even further. And we're going to go backwards in the text even more. And I think we'll, we'll find more clues as to why this matters. And all those are really great answers, but I want to give you a different answer and, and have you consider this. Okay, and this is something I didn't consider until I started diving into this text. Um, but let's see if we can f- build this case that Paul has here. Verse 10, go backwards in verse 10. You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch and Iconium and at Lystra, which persecutions I endured, yet from them all, all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil people and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. So Paul's reminding Timothy of their relationship 
He's reminding them how far they've grown, how far they've, they've come together, how Timothy has followed his teaching, he's followed his conduct, aim in life, faith, patience, love, and steadfastness. And interesting enough, and this struck me, I don't know why it struck me so differently, following in his persecutions and sufferings that happened at those three cities. What Paul might be building here, because he's showing, I think what he's showing Timothy is what an anchored Christian looks like. One who has solid teaching, teaching and roots, one who has good biblically rooted conduct, his goals of life are good, his faith is awesome, his steadfastness, which is all stuff we would say, yay! And then he says, and you also followed me in my persecutions and sufferings. And I think he's saying that all of these things are all part of following Jesus. It's all part of the package of what it looks like to follow Christ. And he presses in on this issue of persecution. And I think in verse 13, we're, he's starting to build, like there's something happening here he's marking. Verse 13, he says, while evil people and impostors go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. I think he's saying something about the idea that there isn't an escape from this world, in this troubled world. The very fact that the elections are so hot right now is because we have a troubled world, right? We feel that at least. In fact, I think Paul promises that Christians, and may I say it this way, those who are taking their faith seriously will face difficult resistance when trouble comes. Verse 12, look at verse 12. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. I think Paul is laying out that suffering or persecution comes to those who trust in Jesus. And how do we hang on in the midst of such, of such difficult times? Through Scripture. And might add other spiritual disciplines. It brings us right back to that cul-de-sac issue, right, right back to where we started. Jesus has rescued us. He has saved us. He has given us new life. And he's given us his word, his Scripture, so that we could be smart and cool with the in crowd. No. It's so that we can be wise about the salvation so that we could face the persecutions that come and that we could be on display in this wicked world of people that are being lied to and being deceived so that we could be complete and equipped for what God has us for the world. It's interesting that the spiritual disciplines aren't just for you. Did you notice that? They're for the world. So, how does the gospel propel us to read our Bibles? I think maybe at this point for some of us, um, there's, there's, there can be an emotional response right now because I just laid out this heavy case of why we should read our Bibles, right? And, and for many of us, we're being confronted with our own lack of reading um, in whatever capacity that is, or, and the temptation might be just to run and chuck it off. I'm not doing this. Or this presentation could come across as, as another guilt trip of what you don't do already and it just push, pushes you further away and creates more distance. It could feel like another law. It could feel, feel like, you, you could probably echo this when I say this, I should read more so that God loves me more. I don't read enough, therefore I don't know God enough. I don't understand what I'm reading, therefore I must not be Christian enough. And I think all of that is enough to stop anybody, keep them from going or even starting. Um, I know, it happens for me, to me from time to time, if I'm being honest. But here's the thing. And this is where I want you to find your encouragement. Jesus knows. He has you right where he wants you. Jesus removes all that guilt and all that shame and the ramifications from that on the cross. It doesn't mean that that stuff doesn't creep in from time to time and tempt us, but it doesn't mean that we have to stay there. The point of reading scripture is to strengthen and mature your tired and perhaps atrophied muscles to move better to be better equipped to understand what Jesus has done for us in the story of Scripture. You are here tonight on purpose. Maybe you're a new believer, don't know what all this Scripture reading thing is, is about. Perhaps you're a seasoned believer who knows that he should be reading more, but can't get over the guilt hump of where you might currently be. Maybe you're so blue-collar you don't read. But let me try and encourage you through the gospel in 2 Corinthians 5. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. There's a new man here. 
All this is from God. This is designed from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us this ministry of reconciliation, this gift. That is, in Christ Jesus, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespass against them and entrusting to us this message, this gift of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. Jesus has made it right between us and God. He has righted our sins. Therefore, we don't have to be burdened with trying to please God to attain any more favor than what Christ has already done for us. We are ambassadors. We are representatives of God. And this message, this reconciliatory message that we get to handle is the message of Christ throughout Scripture. We get to give it away. In other words, we don't have to read Scripture. We get to. The gospel turns duty into delight. We get to read the Bible. Say that with me. We get to read the Bible. So that's the meat of the presentation. I hope that you find encouragement in that. If, if, if this has pricked your heart, good. This made you ask questions, fantastic. But know that Jesus has you right now to ask those hard, hard questions and check your heart. And he wants this for you. He wants you to be a reader of his text. So the next 20 minutes or so, I'm going to spend a lot of time on practical discipleship steps on how we can do this, how we can become regular readers of Scripture and love it, how we can take baby steps, one foot in front of the other. So, so excuse me, I'm going to need water. I, thanks, appreciate it. Um, now, as we dive in, into the practical steps, much of what I'm going to say comes from personal experience. Um, I, I, there, there are no secret special ways to do this. Uh, it just comes from me building up endurance over the years um, like an athlete, like an athlete does. I'm not an athlete. <laughs> Let's just be clear. <laughs> I'll watch athletes on the screen. That's fine. Um, but just like an athlete, you know, it takes up endurance and takes up that muscle, you know, muscle mass, and it takes time to build all that up. Same with um, scripture reading. Um, so I'll, just so you know, all of the following are suggestions, recommend, recommendations, but my desire is that you explore the opportunities before you and seek God's word so you might be enriched as Paul has already laid out. Remember, we said this once before together, we get to read our Bibles, Right? Hang on a second. Pause. Commercial break. Never drank water in front of people like this before. Fascinating. Yeah, isn't it? <laughs> Tastes better. Yeah, church water. Holy water. <laughs> yeah. People in the video are just like, what is going on? All right. Um, number one. I got... I think 10 steps, and we're going to go through these, and some I'll, I'll whiz through a little bit faster because of time. But number one, let's start here. Check your habits. Be honest with where you're at. As a pastor, there are times when um, I get to hear of people's hurts and anxieties of life and difficult things that they're going through. And one of the things that I often ask when I meet with them is, is, is asking them to be honest with their current condition. Basically asking, how'd you get here? Right? How did we get to this point where you're at in this, this messy world that, that you're in? And, uh, and then the other question I often ask is, where do you want to be? How'd you get here? What do you desire? Where do you want to be? So essentially what we're doing is assessing um, what is going on in your life and taking an inventory. And, and while it may not be that you're in a difficult season right now, we can take the same principles to evaluate where we are in relation to our Bible study. So let me ask a few questions. This is not interactive. You don't want to be interactive on this. No one does. Um, but let me ask these questions. You can, you can just do a mental answer here. Um, how often do you read your Bible? Are you a regular reader? Excuse me. What prevents you from being a, a reader of Scripture? And flat out, do you desire being disciplined in this area? Why or why not? The reason why I suggest as our first priority here is check your habits is because what we do in so much of the time in, in our life is habitual. Our routines are typically the same day in and day out. Um, so if you think about your day and, and going from the morning to evening, I would, I would like you to look for ways to move priorities around. And may I suggest um, 
In particular, this is going to rub a lot of people the wrong way. Get up early. <laughs> Kim's like, oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> what better way to start your day than reading Scripture and developing a rhythm of that and engaging with God before you go? And that would include prayer and all the other, all the other disciplines as well. Um, 1 Timothy 4 says this, have nothing to do with irreverent, we've heard this one before, nothing to do with irreverent silly myths, rather train yourself for godliness, for while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. So we have check our habits. Number two, posture. Kind of a weird thing to say, posture. Be ready to submit. Um, there's a mental heart game challenge anytime we try to start something new. When I think, think of this, I think of New Year's resolutions, right? We're all familiar with that. Um, the thing that is different, I think, for this particular issue with Bible readings is that there's a spiritual battle that we're up against. And that's the whole point of the spiritual disciplines, right? Is we're trying to stay in our lane, right? Um, knowing this can help a posture of humility that God is the one who will do the change. And he will help you. We know that because God wants us to ask. And James 1.5 says this, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without a reproach, and it will be given him. Psalm 119 says this, Teach me, this is a request, Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes. Statutes are found where? Scripture. And I will keep it to the end. Give me the request, give me understanding that I may keep your law. Where is the law found? In Scripture. And observe it with my whole heart, everything I have. 35 says, lead me. That's a request. Lead me in the path of your commandments. Where are commandments found? Scripture, for I delight in it. 36, another request. Incline my heart to your testimonies. Where are testimonies found? Scripture. And not to selfish gain. 37, another request, turn my eyes from looking at worthless things and give me life in your ways. Ways are found where? Scripture. Confirm to your servant your promise that you may be feared. Turn away the approach that I dread, for your rules, rules are found in Scripture, are good. Behold, I long for your precepts, which are found in, in your righteousness. Give me life. What we can glean from these verses is that the information loaded in the Bible is given to those who want to know God. And the desire is met with asking and pleading with God to get personal with us. There's a humble posture that comes from that. And this work cannot be conjured up. You can read the Bible. You can conjure that up. You can read it. But you won't gain anything from it if you don't ask God first. You can be knowledgeable. You can be smart, but I think Jesus came up against some smart Pharisees, and they got themselves all cornfused on that, right? They had no heart behind it. So getting close to the breath of God, leaning into him because we find him to be most valuable. Number three is read. Oh, my gosh. Exercise. There's no other way to suggest to you that if we're trying to develop a discipline than to start doing the discipline sometimes. Um, if you are trying to start a running program, you have to run. <laughs> no one wants to hear that. Now, you may have to do intervals of walking and prep with much stretching, hydration, breaks, cool downs, but you still have to run. Likewise, we who desire to be people of the word need to start just by reading it. And I'll argue here for a minute, and this is not to pick on anybody, but I think it's different than listening to it. You know, I've, I've heard arguments saying, I'll, I, just listen to the, I just listen to Scripture on the way to work. And I think there's some, and, and it's not that it's bad. That's fine. It's, it's okay. But I think there's something different with than, you know, opening up your Bible, turning the pages, and reading, and soaking this in, and getting up earlier. Right, Kim? Getting up earlier um, to do that. Um, Plus, when you're driving through Gorst, you, don't need to be, you need to be having all of your concentration on the road, right? We don't, no need to be distracted. I just want to get home, and somebody messed it up for me when it takes an hour and a half to get through Gorst, so come on now. Um, anyway, number four, time and place. This ties right in with uh, getting up early and all that. I won't spend too much time on this. Um, but beginning, beginning this habit, 
you want to have a dedicated time and place to create a situation for you. So it's a, it's a dedicated place you go to. It's 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 a uh, it's regular. So if it's like me in the morning, it's at my desk and spend some time reading. It's just, I'll do the same thing day in day out. So create this habit, um, and I would challenge you if uh, again if if getting up early is, is um, not an option. Perhaps you could do it on your lunch break in your car or something. Look for ways. You can do it. There's a way to do this. And just, just, be, um, just look for a way to um, eliminate distractions. Number five, use study tools. Help from the scholarly types. So we live in a time where there are immense amounts of um, helps and information out there. There are Bibles in many different types of languages and translations. And um, it can be quite overwhelming exhaustive where to start and what kind of Bible to use. But I'm going to go super basic here and just recommend stick with the translation your church uses. Here it's at the ESV. We use the ESV. And uh, there are other good translations out there. But before you explore those, if you're not a Bible reader, stick with the one that your church uses. And then give it time. Then start exploring some of the others to see what their take is on whatever particular scripture um, that you're using. Um, another suggestion I have is a study Bible. Uh, this is, this com- this is uh, twofold. You can use this as a self-defense weapon. <laughs> and you can use the information to really help you bolster your reading. Because in here, in these kinds of these Bibles, a lot of scholars, a lot of pastors, a lot of theologians have really put a lot of effort and time, um, years of experience, to write additional thoughts to anything that you're reading. Uh, now, we don't want to lean on those guys' thoughts, right? Holy. W-H-O-L-L-Y, um, leaning into them 100%, but they're great additional helps, right, for us to understand what we're, what we're reading, right? So I would recommend that. Um, so the ESV study Bible is this one, and uh, I was talking to John about this subject a couple weeks ago, and he's, he recommended the Reformation, Reformation study Bible um, as well. I've never read that, so I don't know, but I got a nod. A good one there. Okay. Um, next help that we can, the next thing we can use, next tool I'm, I'm trying to be interactive. I'm trying to have props. This is amazing. Um, we have these study guides that we produce here, here at Coram Deo. And for the sermon series, the book we're going through Colossians right now. How many of you guys pick these up? I'm just curious. Yeah? Do you use it on a regular basis? That's cool. Um, <laughs> I didn't hear the joke. What was it? Not worth it? Okay. <laughs> okay. These are great. This is a great way, especially if you're a new reader, a beginner or reading your Bible, take this with you. You could be on the same page as what your church is going through. And I would, here's what I would recommend. Try to be a week ahead. Read it a week ahead. Answer the questions a week ahead. Stay the week ahead. And then when you come, then the following Sunday, and John's up here preaching, you could bounce off how God is growing you. And maybe I didn't think of the same way with John. Or it, it pushes and pulls, right? There's, so I think it's a good thing. It's a good help. Um, my next study tool, this is my favorite one because this is the one that is near and dear to me is, is the journaling Bible. Um, when I started taking the Word of God seriously, I found the, this to be the most helpful thing for me. So I'm just, remember, these are my thoughts. I'm sharing them with you. So I'd love for you to come aboard. But um, I found this to be the most helpful thing. And, and, and all it is, is is a Bible in the middle and there's two columns on each side and it gives you space to write notes. And I found that to be the most helpful thing for me to exercise my, my mind and, my, and, 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 my, and what's going on in my heart and just express my thoughts, ask questions, cross out some thoughts from when I reread it. It's like, ooh, why, why did I think that? Cross it out. <laughs> um, and if you see me on any given Sunday, I'll be writing while John's talking. It's just the way I interact with Scripture, and I think it's an extremely helpful way um, to create a study habit. And that way it helps you articulate your thoughts, helps you argue um, with what's going on, argue and think through. I, I use argue in a loose term, you know, to, to really wrestle with the text. And lastly, as a, as a study tool, I would, uh, there are biblical commentators out there. Um, I use one from Wycliffe. It's not that I agree with him on everything or these guys that wrote this, but what it does help me do, it's just like the ESV study Bible, helps me wrestle with guys. They, they've got a lot more work put into like the history of First Chronicles. Oh my gosh, that's a hard one to get through. So I needed help. So I, these guys are a great help to, to get behind what's going on underneath 
in the historical background. So hopefully that's helped. Clear as mud? Okay. Number six, get a study, study buddy. Group strengthening. One of the things that has really helped me in my scripture reading was to gather a group of guys, and I still do this, meet at Starbucks weekly or biweekly and devote a consistent time to read and discuss books of the Bible together. No other helps, no commentaries, just straight observational reading and discussion. And what, we, what I found, what we have found, it's amazing how asking simple questions of the text can really set the anchor down to what Scripture is about. Over time, you'll see the pieces of the biblical puzzle fit together into this one story of Scripture. So I think what it promotes ultimately is this keep going, you've got this attitude, right? You got this, keep going, keep going, this is awesome. And I, I will say this is was pivotal for me in studying um, um, Scripture. Was When I started taking it seriously, I took it seriously with my son. And he was probably, what, junior high, seventh grade? Something like that. I said, you know what? Every Sunday morning before church, 6.30 a.m., we're going to Starbucks. And it was a dirge sometimes. It was, <laughs> it was hard to get there. But we just, we just committed to reading Scripture and discussing it. And that laid the foundation for where I'm at now. And my daughter, the same way. We did the same in, in the text. You guys, grab your kids. Teach your kids. Spend time with them. You're not going to understand it all. It's okay. Just share with them what's going on in the text as you guys discover it together. It's amazing what can happen. Okay, enough of that. Number seven, go to church. Run the race together. We have group strengthening. Now we're running this race together. Uh, I could and, and maybe should have. I don't, could have categorized this prior, as first priority, but in this class, I want to emphasize the idea of reading Scripture for yourself and encouraging you in that way. But there might not be a more crucial thing to push than gathering together as God's people, hearing the word preached, and sharing with one another burdens and joys of being his church together. Uh, Ryan spoke on this incredibly well a couple weeks ago. So if you haven't seen that, go back and watch it. Um, and it's probably the most neglected and overlooked area of, of uh, spiritual discipline as, as we take it so easily for granted. Um, but there's nothing like, like, like it on the planet, like worshiping God together with a congregation. Think about how that applies to us if we're all taking God's word seriously in our own time. Then as we gather and celebrate and worship together, we bring the word that we read, and together, united, we actively use that word of God and apply it to one another in encouragement and admonishment and even singing the scriptures together in our worship. Where else do you do that? It's so awesome. Psalm 105 says this, Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds. Where are his deeds found? Scripture. Among the peoples. Sing to him. Sing praises to him. Tell of all his wondrous works, which are found in Scripture. You get the idea. Colossians 3 says this. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts. Um, one caveat, I think we tend to think, uh, uh, there may be a tendency to think personally when we think of our Christian faith. Um, and yes, spiritual disciplines have a huge personal implication, but the idea of these disciplines is not just for you. I kind of said that already before, but to, but to better the other, the people you're with, promoting the worship and faithfulness of, of God together. And um, yeah, I think that's all I'll say about that for amount of time. So number eight, Get some glasses, get some glasses, have a gospel lens. As you read, wherever you start, you need to know and look for the cohesive agent that binds the Bible together, Jesus. Otherwise, the Bible will come across as nothing more than a strange, moral, religious handbook. And I think Jesus addresses this really well in this famous passage after his resurrection when he meets two guys on the road to Emmaus. We all know this passage. I'm just going to highlight the the one uh, verse, uh, 27. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus, he interpreted to them in all scriptures that the things concerning himself. He took the Old Testament, Moses, the first five books of the Old Testament, and prophets, the rest of the book, and he explained to these two guys, it's me. It's looking for somebody. I'm the guy. 
It's all about Jesus. So we, we need to put a lens on so, so we could see Genesis to Jesus, right? You get that idea, right? And so um, reading Scripture from this gospel story lens, I think it's the most helpful ray, way to read Scripture. Um, so anyway, we can ask six questions. And we're running out of time. That's why I'm kind of jumbled. But six questions we can ask to help us read Scripture with this, this lens. And it, there's something that I learned in third grade. I'm a terrible student, by the way, so it didn't, I didn't recall it until 20-some years later when I started reading Scripture. But it's this who, what, where, when, why, and how. It's the inductive method. Um, so if you ask these six, six questions and you continually ask these six questions, you'll, you won't go wrong. You'll land on Jesus eventually, okay? Stick with it. Um, you can write, so addressing who. Who is writing the book? Who is the book written to? Who are the main characters? What are, what, what are the reasons for writing? What is actually happening? What type of book is this? Poetic, uh, historical, a letter? Where? Where is the location of the scenario? Um, think an Old Testament story. Like, are they in the wilderness? You know? Um, where is the, writing, where is the writer uh, writing from? Paul. Paul from prison to, I don't know, Corinth, right? Um, when? When is the book being written? What's the historical framework behind the when? Why? Why is the book or letter being written? Why does this story exist? I'm thinking of Jonah. What a nutty story, right? Why does this book, book exist? Well, come find out in New Testament, it's all about Jesus. We'll talk about that later if you want. Um, and then how? How does the writing apply to the writer and the receiver? So initially, staying in context, how does this apply to them? Next question to ask and how is, how does this text look for Christ? And last question, how does this apply to me? How do, what do I learn from this? So there's much more on all of that. You could spend uh, an hour on each of those who, what, where, and why's. I mean, there's so much there. But that, that's just a shotgun approach to it. So if you need more help in that area, I'm more than willing to hang out and, and get you going there. Uh, number nine, um, Rest. Pace yourself. Let scripture read you. This seems weird to say when I was writing this. Like, oh, I'm going to poke this bear and see if we can land on this one. Um, periodic rest might be good for the soul. And perhaps a better word for this would be to meditate or pray. Reading scripture is a lifelong, long haul process. Learning how to pace yourself at your level of reading so that you can soak in everything that it has to say. You know, a serious athlete will take periods of time to rest up sore muscles. Maybe they have an injury, um, but it doesn't take him away from achieving his goals of winning, or winning the race, right? He might focus on other things for a period of time, but, but he won't forget what the end goal, goal is. Hebrews 4 says it this way, and I think, let's see if we can use this to shape our thinking on this. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joint and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Scripture is active. It moves. And it doesn't move in a casual way. It is likened to that of a sword. And what is the sword meant for? Anybody? Dividing, yeah? Brandon's demonstrating it right now. Slaying, yeah. Defending, cutting, slicing, stabbing, it cuts and pierces to the point of getting to the heart. It's reading us. For the reader who is reading to get to God's heart will soon know that God is using his word to get to ours. He is shaping and moving. He is the one that is active. So to read, then rest, or ask God, what are you teaching me? is submitting to the use of his word to pierce to our soul with the purpose of being aligned and, and obeying him. Ezekiel 36 says it this way, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes found in scripture and be careful to obey my rules found in scripture. 
His rules, his statutes, the text of Scripture, and all the principles of living godly life are found nowhere else except in the breadth of his text. And in this reference, in Ezekiel, who's doing the work? The Holy Spirit, God himself. He promises that it will cause us to walk as we engage his word, being careful to follow his rules. He changes us, and he uses Scripture, empowered by the Holy Spirit, to do it. Again, I don't want you to take this as an extra thing to pile on top of yourself, but as an opportunity of joy for us to know that he has us and he will help us. He is living and active, and he will use his living sword to cut through us. And number 10, we have extra practice. Practice what you know. This is the bonus extra credit portion of the show. Um, uh, there, there are, I want you to be encouraged to not only read it, plead with God, ask me, help me, change me, but practice, re, practice what is being read, right? Practice what you're learning. Express your thoughts with others and help shape the others' lives and yours as you do this. Um, when I cut my teeth in, in reading Scripture, taking it seriously, again, Tyler was uh, in junior high, so this reminds me of this so well. I was a leader at a youth group, and um, I I, I was able to apply what I was learning and teach the young boys what was going on in the text of Scripture. And it was a great way to discuss biblical themes, um, to get involved in young people's lives in a really unique way. And the questions that they ask (laughs) will help shape you, because they're going to ask you something, you know, I don't know what I don't know what you mean by that, but let me find out. And so it's a shaping thing. You're shaping them, and they're shaping you, right? You get the idea. So I want you to consider looking out to the kids at Coram Deo. And if you have kids and you aren't reading with them, do it, okay? End of discussion there. But if you're doing that, or you don't have kids, I want you to consider youth community or the kids' ministry we have here at Coram Deo and become a leader. Exercise what you're learning and share with them what is going on. Um, in your life as you're reading the text of Scripture. Um, another more practical way for you to share with, uh, what you're learning is uh, in life groups. Perhaps you could take a sharing role um, in what you're learning or lead a life group with a Bible reading emphasis. And those are just a few things. Perhaps you can do that. But I want to give you another example that is way more real and scares the pants off everybody when this happens. And you peer through the, the peephole in your door And who do you see? Two young gentlemen, white shirts, ties, and a square name tag that says Elder So-and-So. This happened a few months ago in our house. And first of all, I always love it when they come over. That's just my thing. I love it when they come in. I'm inviting them in. I'm like, whoo! And uh, (laughs) usually scares them. But this time, I was, I, and I always offer this. Hey, you guys want to come over for dinner? Because they, they, they don't have good meals, usually. And come over for dinner, and, and we'll uh, talk. We'll talk about anything you want. We don't, talk, we, don't, we don't have to talk about anything. We can talk about everything, whatever you want. And this is the first time that these boys took me up. I couldn't believe it. I almost, my jaw hit the floor. Um, first of all, I told them, look, you guys always come at the worst time. So can we schedule this? Um, next week. And sure enough, they came. I couldn't believe it. They came. And we probably spent a couple hours with them as a family, just talking, life stuff and everything. And then they wanted to talk about Scripture. I said, oh, this is fun. Let's talk about Scripture. Yes. And they tried to give me a good word from their, their Mormon. Well, they used Bible, because I said I won't accept the, um, the Mormon text. Um, and they tried to give me a good word of encouragement. Fine. And then I asked them, do you, is, you realize that's not what that's really saying, right? I was able to share with them what Scripture was actually saying and share with them. And, and it ended up leading to a whole bunch of other different kinds of discussion. It ended up leading amicably leaving, nothing won or lost, right? And they ended up meeting with my kids. My kids wanted to pursue them a little more. And they took them to Starbucks. And a couple meetings, two meetings later, one of the boys looked at my kids and said, help. We don't know what happened after that. He's gone. They are only here for a few weeks, a few months. But you're able to challenge him, challenge them with the words they say they believe. 
and not in a way that is mean, way because you love them, because God loves them, right? So I challenge you. Say yes to that knock. You don't have to know it all, right? In closing, I want to remind you that the Bible is not a handbook, not just a handbook. It is life-giving words from God's breath. He wants you close to him. He wants you to hear his voice. He wants you to feel the warmth of the air from his mouth. He desires that we practice and practice living in light of his words, making us wise unto the salvation he's given us through Jesus Christ. I want you to know this one thing. You get to read the Bible. So let me pray to close. God, thank you so much for your word. It is so life-giving. I pray that this was a huge encouragement for folks, that they would know that they can read the Bible, they can understand it. It may take time, but they can be readers of the Bible and they can be encouraged by it and encourage one another in this church. Lord, may we use this spiritual discipline and other spiritual disciplines to help sharpen one another, to be people of the word, to, to demonstrate to the, the liars and deceitful people of the world how good you are for your namesake. Amen. I want to give you a couple of uh, uh, helpful resources. I, I entitled this Books You Can Actually Read. I like small books. So um, I'm just going to go through a couple of these. I'll show them to you, and then you can come up and look at them. Um, not that one. How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth. Pick this one up. Very readable. Hermeneutics, all that stuff. That's a big word. A study. How do you study your Bible? All that stuff, history, everything that's in here. It's jam-packed. It's extremely readable. One that goes with it that I didn't know existed until sometime later is how to read the Bible book by book. Book by book. How do you read that book? Because each book's different, right? Psalms is different than uh, Revelation. Thank the Lord. <laughs> and, and so it gives you perspective on how to read that Bible and really can encourage you and propel you like, oh, I can read that. I can understand that. Um, and also, next book, Before You Open Your Bible by Matt Smethers. Look at this one. Look, when I open it up, look. Look at all how little the, there's, there's hardly any words in it, so it's very readable. <laughs> you blue-collar guys will love this book. Um, it's nine heart postures for approaching God's word. So it's basically a, a primer for getting your heart ready to read God's word and having a disciplined approach to that. Um, and the last book is, well, there's two. I'm missing one. I think I gave it away to somebody and never came back, but um, this book, According to Plan by Graham Goldsworthy, gives you the big idea picture of what Scripture is all about. It's one story. It's one story, and we miss it so much as Christians. We get lost in the story, and this helps you stay on that story. And the last uh, resource is an online resource. I love this one because it has cartoons in it. It's called thebibleproject.com, um, and it's a real cartoony way of telling the story of Scripture, I like to go through a book of Bible, then watch it and see how I lined up. And uh, I know, I think, Pete, I sent one to you. And, you know, it's a great way to, in, in five to ten minutes, of what, what it's all about and in a cartoon format. So it's entertaining at the same time. So good for kids, good for us blue-collar guys. So um, with that, I have two minutes for the dreaded Q&A.